So one of the work that one of the places where I work at is in Moray in French Polynesia. Because if you have to do work, you may as well just choose a great place. <laughs> I mean, this is just rule number one. I mean, you know, there are some people that really like to work inland in Alaska in wintertime. Not me, not at all. <laughs> so, um, and in Morea, it's really convenient because there are field stations. It's actually really, really simple. It's simple to work there. The people are great. The food is uh, amazing. That's great. Um, so, uh, clownfishes live in anemones, that's this sort of thing that looks like a plant, but it's an animal, it's an cnidarian, and there's a small clownfish at the base over there. They live inside the anemones, and we can, uh, we can track them really well. In Morea, there are very few clownfishes. There is only one species, and there are very few individuals. Uh, there is a total of probably less than 1,000 individuals. So it's big enough to do experiments and small enough to be somewhat manageable. So the way we do it is that we take a boat, we take a rope, and we are towed behind the boat with, uh, we have a GPS in our hand and a mask on, and every time we see an anemone, we GPS it. And then we go back to it, and then we go there and we grab the, the clownfishes. So this is uh, the next slide. So you see we go with a net, we grab the clownfishes. The clownfishes are very easy to, to catch because they cannot get out of the anemone. Sometimes it takes time, there's a sort of, cat and mouse kind of game, but they're not going anywhere. So we take them, we measure them. Clownfishes are uh, hermaphrodites, and they change sex during their lifetime. So the large ones are the females, the small ones are the males. And then when the male grows bigger, it turns into a female again. So uh, then we uh, cut a little bit of their caudal fin. It grows back within about two weeks, so we, it doesn't damage it. This is what the cut fin looks like. Then we uh, grab the fish, take a nice picture, and then we put it back in the, uh, in the anemone. In this case, we messed up, so we had to cut it twice. You know, sometimes there's a current and the fin flies out, so we cut it second time. We put it in a vial, and then we, uh, we do genetics of these guys. So first, this is a map of the island of Morea, and where you see the dots is where there are anemones. The anemones are not distributed completely homogeneously, and the size of the dot represent how many clownfishes were in those anemones. So right now we have about seven or eight hundred individuals, so we have almost all the individuals of Morea. I want to remind you what the main question is. The question is, where are the babies going? Are the babies staying in Morea, going somewhere else, going to Tahiti? It's very close to Tahiti, it's from French Polynesia, to Tetiaroa, to other islands. So the way we do it is that we grab all the fish, and then we have really two piles. One pile is the large fish, which are the adults, and the other pile is the babies. And we uh, did some uh, microsatellite analysis, so genetic analysis, a so fingerprint, very much like you would do forensic analysis. And then we have two, two, data, two data sheets, and we have a software that is going to assign one to the other. So on one side we have parents, on the other side we have babies, and we just ask, are any of these babies coming from any of these parents? And so by looking at the genotypes, it tells us if it's the case or not. And so one possibility is that there would be no match whatsoever. And so that would mean that all the parents are having babies, but the babies are taken out by currents and sent somewhere to other islands. Or a certain portion of them would come back on the islands and things like that. This is what the results are. So the results are... Uh, we did that three years, uh, three years, 2007, 8, and 10. Actually, we did a few more years after that. I, I, I don't show the slide, they all are similar. And the arrows that are on these uh, uh, slides show where the arrow is pointing to is where the larva landed, and the, the, the beginning of the arrow is where the parents were found. What was really great for us, the very first time we had these results, is that we had no idea what we would find, right? And uh, the first time, there was an assignment, and it was assigned to two individuals. But because we have codes, we had no idea where those individuals were found, so we had to go back to our notes and say, okay, where were these two parents found? And sure enough, they are found on the same anemone, so that matches what we were expecting. Same deal with... Um, all of them, there were no situations where the two parents were from different places. So this, the system works really well. So now we have determined that a number, a 
sizable portion, about 35% of the individuals actually have babies that come back on the island. So it's definitely a very, very crucial thing to be able for the babies to find their ways back to, uh, to the island. There is also a very applied thing that I just want to mention in passing. A similar system was studied on the Great Barrier Reef by uh, Hugo Harrison and Jeff Jones. And what they did is that they studied two species, uh, a grouper and a snapper. The grouper is at the top, the snapper is at the bottom. And these are islands on the Great Barrier Reef, and the green uh, squares are where there are marine reserves. And what they said is that they said, okay, as you can see, there are some parents that are found on marine reserves, and the babies are coming out of the reserves and seeding other regions where fishermen can fish. So the reserves are really helping fishermen catch more fish elsewhere outside of the reserve. And then a certain portion of the babies come back in the reserves and are reseeding themselves. So the reserves are very, very effective. So knowing our results and these results, the uh, government of Morea decided to establish marine reserves based on our data and say, okay, these are regions that are really important because that's where all the babies tend to aggregate and that's where they're going to come back and things like that. So there are also some applied things. But what is important here is that at the level of the, the scent and the, uh, the capability of smelling things, these animals are just going just outside of the reef. They are places where we have evidence that they go out of the reef, and then they go back in the reef, they can smell it. And it's very likely that if you tamper with their sense of smell, they are not able to come back on the reef. And this is going to have a huge repercussion in just the repopulation of any place. And so that's, at this level, it's very, very important. There are two things that the sense of smell is going to do. One is going to change the homing behavior, and another thing is going to change the uh, predator avoidance. So predator avoidance is a situation where fish, you know when people say fish smell, actually they don't really smell. What happens is that on their skin, they have mucus, they have proteins, and when the proteins break down, they start smelling. So actually smell that fish that is not fresh is smelling. But uh, uh, in the water, other fish can smell each other because they can smell the precise uh, amino acid composition of the mucus of each fish. And they can recognize the difference between their own species and another species. Particularly, they can, see if the, they can smell if the species is a prey or it's a predator. Uh, because each species have, has a very specific protein signature on their mucus. So it's really important for the fish to be able to smell. I'll get back to that in my very last slide. So if this is true, we wanted to do a number of tests. And so this is uh, uh, the next set of experiments that I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is in California. As much as I like warm water, California at the end of the day is gorgeous, and so it's really nice to work here. And uh, here we have a guild of species that are called rockfishes. They are sold on the market as red snappers, but they are hardly ever red. They're just rockfishes. And we took two species, the blue rockfish. There is a picture here of an adult, so you see what the adult looks like, but we work with babies, which is at the top right. And the copper rockfish. Oh just for those of you who are very much into it, the, the species name of this rockfish is called Mistinus. Sebastis, which means magnificent, and Mistinus, which means priest, because of the dark robe, which I think is fantastic. But that's another story. Um, and this one is uh, the copper rockfish, and uh, the uh, top right again is the baby. So these are two very, very common rockfishes, and the reason why we picked those is because the uh, oceanographic regime of this year, this is experiments that we're doing right now, favors the recruitment of these babies. So right now there is a ton of these babies. So for us, it's really easy to get them and to study them. So the way we do it is that we, we dive in water that is really murky. If you've been diving in California, sometimes it's very clear. Most of the time it's like this or worse. And we have little nets and we just catch baby rockfish. 
And so we, uh, we grab them with uh, hand nets and a number of different nets and things like that. And then we grab these, uh, these little babies. If you want to do proper experiments to determine if ocean acidification is going to have an effect, it's very difficult to use adults because the adults are completely developed and things like that. So what you want is to take the smallest possible babies and then you're going to subject them to various acidification scenarios. It's not completely ideal, but it's just as good as it gets. So we have what I call the climate change machine. So this is a setup where on the right side, behind that white wall, there is a number of very large tanks of CO2. And they go in through the wall, through those tiny pipes, the colored pipes that you see on the, on the side here, right here. It's all monitored by a teeny tiny laptop, the small laptops that people buy to be in airplanes, you know. And, uh, and then the laptop itself controls a number of injectors that are on this wall here, on the wall on this side here, and then it goes into another room. The next room is a room that has a bunch of fish tanks. That's this room here. And then on the computer, you can determine the pH of each one of those tanks. So what we did is that we uh, treated the fish with four different types of pH. 8.0 is the control, and then various types of scenarios that people are assuming will, uh, will occur, which is mid-century, end of century, extreme situation, who knows what will happen. As soon as we get the fish, we put them in there, and for several months, we kept the fish at those pHs. The fish are doing fine, but then what we want to know is to do a number of experiments after that. So we did two things. We did um, experiments with the animals themselves, and then we did some genomic experiments. So what I'm talking about here first is predator avoidance. So for predator avoidance, we uh, have some uh, likely predators. There is a number of things that prey on uh, baby rockfish, but we took the more common ones. The more common ones are on the left is called a cabazon. It's a big sculpin. And on the right is a lingcod. I don't know if uh, you've heard about these fishes. They're very relatively common in uh, California. And they prey on uh, rockfish, on baby rockfish, and even on adult rockfish, actually. So what we did next is that we kept them in tanks for a very long time. And obviously, we did not put our very precious rockfish with those guys. Otherwise, they would be eaten. That was absolutely not our intention because we wanted to kill them ourselves uh, for the next experiments. So instead, what we did is that we let those animals stew in water for a very long time and shed a lot of their proteins in the water. And then we took that smelly water, which to us doesn't smell at all, incidentally, and then we put it in a, in a system that is shown here. Here we put some food coloring just for you to see the difference. So this is a system where you have water that is flowing in this sort of funnel that is separated by a, a wall ha only halfway through the funnel. And on one side, we put the scent of the predator. On the other side is water that is clean. And then at the back of that, we put a small rockfish and we see where the rockfish goes. Can it avoid the smell or not? And we did two experiments. We did this one, and then we did a swimming experiment. As far as this experiment is concerned, as we were fearing, the results are very conclusive, unfortunately, and it's that at regular pH, let's say, the fish immediately are freaking out and going where the predator is absent, and as soon as you lower the pH, the fish is just swimming and, and doesn't care at all about the smell of the, of the predator. This is a huge problem, but that's what is up in store for us. Uh, as far as the swimming is concerned, same deal. A fish that is at regular pH swims for a very long time and very well, which 
is really important for escape response. It can escape predators very, very well. When the pH is lowered, the fish is very sluggish and does not move quite as fast. And a lowered pH has a much stronger effect on a small fish than on a large one. So predators have, it's a double whammy for the small fish. Cannot smell the predator and cannot even swim away from it. So it's not great. That is the, the experiment that is done in the, in the lab, let's say. So, where I come in is that, okay, we, this is amazing, but now what we are interested in is trying to do some, uh, some uh, molecular work. So the type of response that we're interested in at this uh, uh, stage was an experiment of uh, gene expression. What we wanted to know is, okay, the fish are doing this after several months at low pH, are they altering their gene expression to either compensate for the, uh, the fact that the entire environment has changed? Are they expressing different genes? What is going on at the level of the gene expression? So this uh, whole experiment is done with uh, two friends and collaborators, Sherry Logan, who works at uh, California State uh, Monterey Bay, and Scott Hamilton at Moss Landing Marine Labs. And so what we did is that after all these experiments were done, we, we met for several days and very carefully started dissecting those fish. Uh, we ha you have to take them alive because RNAs are uh, very, very unstable molecules. You need to have a vat of um, liquid nitrogen. You dissect really quickly a lot of different organs in very small animals, and then you put them in liquid nitrogen to stop any reaction that would degrade the RNAs. Um, this is Will Fenny, who did actually the experiments of, uh, of uh, swimming. This is the student of Scott's. And uh, I did not have any pictures of us dissecting. I'll show you why in a second. And so I asked him, do you mind taking pictures of you dissecting? So he just took these pictures this morning. And he had to sacrifice a fish that had nothing to do with this experiment just to show you what we did. So I know it's terrible. So uh, this is roughly what we do. You know, the fishes are really small. And we had this line. So one person, uh, I mean, Scott was dissecting the brain. and. Uh, I was dissecting the liver, and every person was dissecting different organs to go as fast as possible and put in the liquid nitrogen. The reason why is because all of us were actually more interested in only one thing, and that was what was going on. There was the, the race, of the America's Cup was going on, so we had a big screen of the America's Cup while we were dissecting, and so we didn't take pictures of ourselves. And so the outcome was great for us, not for the Kiwis. Um, so what we did after that, is that the RNAs were extracted, and now we, we used um, uh, the new uh, uh, sequencing techniques. You know, now you can sequence millions of, uh, of uh, sequences very, very rapidly and relatively inexpensively. And so what we did is what is called RNA, an RNA-seq method, which is a whole transcriptome shotgun sequencing. The, the way you do it is that in the old days, when you wanted to know the expression of the RNAs, it was really complicated because you needed to quantify just each type of RNA and know how much was expressed, which was very, very complicated, very elegant work, but very complicated. Now instead, what we do is that we extract the RNA, we make some uh, um, cDNAs, we copy it into DNA, which is more stable, and then we cut it in a lot of fragments and then sequence the whole thing. We just don't even bother trying to do anything. We just sequence the entire thing. And the result is that in this case, we had 28 million reads of only 100 base pairs. And then, with, which are very small fragments, and then we have software that allows us to then reconstruct by just overlapping all those little fragments into full genes. And so with 28 million reads, you have so much material that you can reconstruct all the genes that have been uh, that were transcribed in the first place, and then also to quantify them. So it's a very, very powerful method. The only problem that we have is that I need about two terabytes of RAM to be able to do it. And so in, uh, in my, uh, at UCSC, we have a one terabyte machine. And so actually, I have to work in Pittsburgh. I mean, I'm 
at home, but I work in Pittsburgh where they have a very large machine just to be able to crunch the numbers. The cr numbers are, it's, it's kind of a, a heavy thing uh, as far as the computing is concerned. You get uh, nice uh, distributions of sizes of transcripts, but um, here I'm just going to give you a few um, highlights of the types of results that we get. So we have uh, assembled about 56 million bases with uh, just 100 base pair at a time. And the total number of RNAs that we were able to get per individual is about 120,000. So that is really good because that we have all of us, fish and us, it's the same deal. We have about 25,000 genes, and of those, very few of them are actually expressed. And what you want is to be able to have all the expression of all the genes that are expressed. So with this, we have very large redundancy, and we're able to see just every single molecule that is in the cell. We are able to sequence it and say, okay, how much of it is there? Uh, the average length of these reconstructions was 800 base pairs. The smallest was 200, but the largest was 21,000. And there are very large genes. The largest gene in, uh, in fish that we're able to get is about 30,000 base pairs is the titan. And it's, the titan happens to be a very coiled protein that is involved with muscles. And so right now we are we are crunching the numbers. I mean, I was doing it this morning, and I've been doing it for the last two months, actually. But uh, almost all the genes that are overexpressed that we have seen so far, almost all of them are involved with muscle function. The big problem of these fishes, clearly, is much more movement than olfaction. And so olfaction, I think, is going to play a really important role, and we're going to go down the line to find those genes. But you have, like, something like 50 or 100 genes that are all dedicated to have this guy try to swim faster. And that is uh, really fascinating. So that's one of the uh, main results that we got so far.